हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम बैक टू द सेकेंड पार्ट ऑफ द आर टी आर सीरीज वील बी स्टार्टिंग अबाउट द एयरपोर्ट एरोड्रोम्स एयर स्ट्रिप्स एंड अ फ्यू बेसिक टर्मिनोलॉजीज दैट आर रिक्वायर्ड टू बी अंडरस्टूड बिफोर वी कैन गेट स्टार्टड विद द फॉर्मैट्स एंड सी हाउ दिस होल थिंग ऑफ कॉलिंग द ए टी सी फंक्शंस सो इन केस यू नॉट वॉच द वीडियो बिफोर दिस आई वॉच यू टू प्लीज गो वॉच इट इट्स टाइटल ए टी एस एंड एयर स्पेसिस दैट विल क्लियर अ लॉट ऑफ योर बेसिक्स रिगार्डिंग द फिजिकल स्ट्रक्चर of a uh, air traffic service for those of you who watched that video or know already what is the physical structure of the area control approach and the tower for you you can continue the video from here itself so let's get started so we'll be seeing what's the main difference between the airport the aerodrome and an airstrip so imagine we have a runway here okay and this is a taxiway as you excuse my drawing but this is the runway this is the taxi one then we have a apron so an apron is somewhere where all the aircrafts are parked okay and the runway is where the takeoffs and landings of the aircrafts happen and the part joining the apron to the runway that's from here all the way till here this is called a taxi way so now how do we define what is an airport what is an aerodrome and what is an air strip so airport is this where the runway the taxi way and the apron are all connected together and at the apron you have obviously you have an aircraft parking but you also have customs immigration officers terminal and passenger facilities this is basically a port of entry hence this is called an airport you need custom officers there you know it's a port of entry into the country this is where you're going to be checked your documents can be asked when you're entering aerodrome on the other hand is exactly everything that an airport is but it is a designated area which is only used for parking for passengers cargo refueling and maintenance there is no immigration facility here neither is there any custom facility here so a uh, aerodrome plus custom and immigration gives you airport so the main difference between airport and a aerodrome is that they do not have a uh, aerodrome does not have customs and immigration facilities with it now what's an air strip an air strip is nothing but a designated piece of land that is authorized for the use of takeoffs and landings only usually air strips do not have an apron they might have an additional area but it would not be officially classified as an apron this is what we usually mean when we talk about air strips now you have these various parts of an atc okay you have a surface movement control wherever it's necessary you have a tower you have a area control you have an approach so let's see what does each and every one of this do theek hai before we see that one major difference that you people have to understand is the difference between uncontrolled and controlled aerodrome so in simple words uncontrolled aerodrome is going to be a place which has no air traffic control authority meaning there is nobody on ground who is giving you that is the pilot any instructions regarding how to fly what headings to follow what flight levels to go at you're not getting all this information there is nobody controlling you okay in most simpler words a uncontrolled airspace is somewhere where tower is missing it is in there on the contrary a controlled airspace would be somewhere where a tower is present where there is a air traffic controlling authority so now let's see what does a in a controlled airspace we have a surface movement control what does the surface movement control do so the surface movement controller smc as it's called when we are speaking over rt it is transmitted as ground we address them as ground okay what is their jurisdiction how long do they take care of us what is their exact job so they take care of us as long as we are on the apron all the way to the whole shot line meaning if there is an smc available at the airport he would guide us and give us instructions to take our plane all the way from here which is our apron all the way from our taxi way up until our whole shot line this whole is the jurisdiction of the smc or the surface movement control okay that's what we talk about here the jurisdiction is from the apron to the whole shot the next portion is called the aerodrome control tower again if you've not watched this video i will be covering it very in a very concise manner here but to understand a little more about it you can always go back to the previous video 
So an aerodrome control tower or over RT it is transmitted or called as tower. Its jurisdiction begins where the apron finishes off. Okay. In case you know your SMC is not available. So it begins from your apron where SMC is not available. In case your SMC is available, it begins from your hold shot line, which is from here. So the moment your aircraft crosses this line here, you have to start calling the tower now. Your the SMC or surface movement control controller's responsibility as long as you're on the apron and on the taxiway. Once you cross the whole shot line, you are you become the responsibility of the tower. We've discussed this in the previous video that the tower's responsibility is nothing but giving you your takeoff and landing clearance. Just that, that are you clear to take off? Are you clear to land? So basically the runway is his main jurisdiction for the tower. Okay. So the moment you cross a whole shot line and there is an SMC available, in that case, the tower's jurisdiction starts only after the whole shot line. In case there is no SMC available, then you straight away deal with the tower right from when you're on the apron. Fine. And there are a few restrictions with what a tower structure is. So covering it in short, laterally I say that they should cover an area of radius 25 nautical miles from the center. On the ATS charts, when you see it is given as a blue dotted line. Okay, it's given as a blue dotted line on the map. Now, then you have the next portion is called the approach control office. Over RTR, when we are transmitting, we usually use the word approach, we address them as approach. So you have your approach control office. Now what are their jurisdictions? See, all of these things have a vertical limit. Okay, we've covered that in the last video. The approach control office, if I were to explain you the structure very quickly, it would be that you have a tower here. Think of it like Lego blocks. You have a tower here. Then you have the approach control. And then you have the area control. Fine. We spoke about this. Now, the approach is nothing but it's a layer that is sandwiched between your area control. Right? This is your area control. And this is your tower. So it's sandwiched between them. So the upper limit of your tower and the lower limit of your area control will give you the defined boundaries of approach. If in the exam on your map, it's not given. So you could just take lower limit of area control and upper limit of tower. This as the vertical limits for approach. Okay. I hope it makes sense. Then you have something that's known as the area control center. We usually address it as control. Okay, when we are calling them over RT, we call it as control. Now, on a side note, there's something also very interesting about an air traffic um, controllers building. Have you seen they all have a tinted glass and it's always inclined? It always looks like this. Look at any ATC. It's always tint. It's always tilted, right? You see this tilt here. This tilt is given to minimize reflections to the pilot. There's no light. Whatever light is there, it should always get reflected towards the ground. If it were to be a straight sheet of glass, okay, the chances are that it could have gotten reflected. Okay. Hence, they are always inclined. So if, they've, if you're ever asked this in part two, you know why are they inclined. It's usually there to protect the aircraft from reflections. Now, you have something that's known as your aerodrome traffic zone. Okay, now what is your aerodrome traffic zone? Your aerodrome traffic zone is basically the whole area that is your maneuvering area and the whole vicinity of your aerodrome. All of that together is addressed as your aerodrome traffic zone. So all the traffic in and around your aerodrome within a defined region is going to be considered as an aerodrome traffic. Now how big is this area? Okay, usually, usually, five nautical miles from the center that is five nautical miles laterally and five thousand feet agl these are the minimum minimum boundaries of a aerodrome traffic zone okay the aerodrome traffic zone of any aerodrome mind it i'm saying aerodrome has to be five nautical miles laterally and five thousand feet at least in height okay these are the basic minimum requirements of an aerodrome traffic zone so they include all the areas that is traffic on the maneuvering area is their job vicinity of the aerodrome whatever traffic is there that is again their job on the apron on the taxiway and on the runway 
all of this comes under the aerodrome traffic zone and it again comes under the authority of tower okay then you have something that's known as your ctr and cta ctr is known as your control zone many places you'll see this written as ctz so ctr stands for control zone by definition this is the controlled airspace that starts from a surface of the earth up to a specified upper limit so you remember we drew something like this we drew a tower like a lego brick then we drew our approach and then we drew our area control right now this one starts these all have vertical limits so the airspace which starts from the ground to a specified upper limit this whole portion is called a ctr okay and by definitions and by you know rules the minimum minimum radius of a ctr has to be 5 nautical miles okay a ctr cannot be smaller than 5 nautical miles it has to be greater than 5 nautical miles and if at all it's greater it should be multiples of 5 it could be 5 nautical miles it could be 10 it could be 15 it could be 20 25 but it has to be a multiple of 5 again the controlling authority in this portion is the tower then you have something that's known as the control area so this is a controlled airspace that starts from a already predefined level and extends upwards from there meaning again the lego brick diagram we drew we just spoke about how this portion all of this this portion is the ctr that is starts from the ground to a specified upper limit everything now this whole portion starting from here all the way extending upwards is called the cta or the control area by definition if you see it means a area that is starting at a defined point and extending upwards controlled airspace starting from one specified upper limit to another specified upper limit then you have something that you'll see very frequently this is called your tma that's your terminal control area this is your controlled airspace that starts from one specified upper limit to another specified upper limit usually a tma is where a lot of your air routes for now just think of air routes as highways so a tma is where a lot of your highways are coming and intersecting that's that's what you mean by a tma now that we have understood and you know kind of defined all of these terms i want us to look at ats services in general see we've understood how do we communicate how do we you know function when we are within a controlled airspace and we have a air traffic authority now the question is how do we deal with them if we enter into an uncontrolled area right so to understand this what you need to understand is the general structure of the air traffic services so the air traffic services is broadly divided into mota mota it's three parts okay ats is divided into c t and a sorry it is divided into c i and a c meaning control i meaning information a meaning alerting it's is just a easy acronym to remember this is the investigation agency so it's just easy to remember c i and a there's also something that's known as your advisory airspace so your air traffic controller it's under him that you have three portions okay it's under him that if you have a smc then you'll have an smc otherwise you'll have a tower you'll have a approach and then you'll have an area control okay we just studied about what do they do if i were to again define it smc handles ground movement of aircrafts tower handles takeoffs and landings of aircraft approach handles departing slash arriving traffic okay and area control broadly manages the en route segment okay once you're on the airway they take care of you then you have something that's known as your advisory services if you've studied air spaces you would have noticed that advisory air space is given in class foxtrot for ifr flights right it's given to ifr traffic then you have your alerting services they basically just deal with your search and rescue most importantly now when we are talking about uncontrolled air spaces you need to understand what flight information services are so no flight information services by definition they just means services which are provided for the safety of a flight okay it's all the necessary information the pilot will need for a safe conduct of flight let me give you an example okay so we are here now 
I want you guys to uh, pause it for a second, read through. I've explained it in the form of a story as to what flight information services are. So I want you to go through it. I want you to read it out. I'll just read out the definition initially. What are flight information services? Flight information services are support services for pilots. They provide information on weather, traffic, navigation, and emergencies. They help pilots plan and execute flights safely and efficiently. FIS includes pre-flight data, in-flight updates, traffic information, navigational assistance, and emergency support. Now, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. It's, it's very hard to understand it from this definition. So I want you to take a moment and read the story out. Okay, this is exactly what a flight information services does. Feel free, pause the video, read it out. Okay, now that you've read what flight information services do, one more additional point which I want you to keep at the back of your head is that flight information services along with advisory services, okay, these are usually complementary. They are usually given together. Okay. Now, this is provided to all the identified traffic. Now, what do you mean by identified traffic? Identified traffic is basically all the airplanes who have filed a flight plan. Okay. They identify them. They know their intentions and it's provided to both of them. Okay. Flight information services is usually volunteered for wherever required or if you're in an uncontrolled airspace, you can always request for flight information services. I'd recommend you to go and read airspaces. Again, that's, you know, class A, class B, class C, class D. I'll recommend you to go and read that again while keeping in mind what is advisory service and what is flight information services. It will help you understand this concept better. Now, your flight information services can be contacted only and only if it is mentioned in your question paper. This I'm talking strictly with regards to RTR exams. You can contact them only if it is written in your question paper. Okay. Otherwise, if you know you're in an uncontrolled airspace, it would be given which flight information services are going to be provided to you. Otherwise, otherwise you will be contacting some something or it will be mentioned as a defense control. Okay. Only when it is mentioned in this note, will you contact FIS? Otherwise, you will never contact FIS. Okay, this I'm talking with the with the, with the logic of papers itself. Now, what do we do if we are outside the limits? So how do we deal with it? So firstly, we look out for a note that hey, if we are in an uncontrolled airspace. Now, what do I mean when I say we are in a controlled airspace? I mean this. Okay. If, if these lines signify the limits of these aircrafts, what I mean as with an uncontrolled aircraft is this. Okay. Now, firstly, if I'm any one of these aircrafts, I will first check the note. Okay. I'll look if they have told me that in such a scenario, what FIS can I contact? In case there's nothing there. Okay. And we figure it out that we are within the lateral limits. Okay. But below the level, meaning... I am in the lateral limits of the area control for this aircraft. I am in the lateral limits, but vertically I am not in his airspace. If this is a side view of the whole thing. So I'm not vertically in his airspace. Similarly for him, I might laterally be in the area of approach, but vertically I am not. In that case, what will I do? For all the three aircrafts, the scenario is nearly the same. That laterally we are in somebody's boundaries, but vertically we aren't. So what do we do? So we contact the overhead authority, meaning even if I'm an aircraft here, I will make sure I'll tune into the area controls frequency and I'll try to get in touch with them. For him, I will try to contact approach. If I were him, I would again try to contact area control. Now the question is, why would you tune to a frequency that's above you, you know, of an area that's above you? So the logic is that you try to remain in contact with the ATC that's overhead, that for you, this one, for this one, this one. Because so that you you are able and to monitor traffic in case there is an uncontrolled descent from top or there is a crash landing of an aircraft. Okay, or there is a depressurization. N number of scenarios, but all of them, you'll study about it slowly. You'll realize all of them include descending down. Which is why I tune into the upper limit or the, you know, region that's above me so that I have a very clear idea of any traffic, if at all, that is descending. Okay. 
is basically just to be safe from descending traffic. Now, an additional part. Remember, we spoke about highways. So these highways are nothing but ATS routes. Okay, you've you've heard me use this term before. An ATS route is just simply a highway in the sky. It's a designated area within which control will be provided. Okay, and it takes you from point A to point B. Okay, this is the center line of the airway or the ATS route, and it's ten nautical miles on both sides of the center line. So this is your corridor. Okay, this is called your airway corridor. So this is your center line of the airway, ten nautical miles both sides it extends. This is your ATS route or a highway. Now your ATS routes, we'll have to understand how are they named to understand what are their functions. So ATS route at any given point has three parts. Okay, even if I take any route for that example, Golf four five zero Whiskey two eight North, uh, you know let's say Alpha four seven four. Any any route. I'm just considering this for example. So if you notice, they all have something common. The first portion is always going to be a letter. Take it. It can be any letter from Alpha to Zulu. Then the second portion is going to be a number. Okay, it could be any number from one to nine nine nine. For us, it's two eight here. For us, it's four seven four here. For us, it's four five zero here. It could be anything. So three portions. First portion is a letter. Second portion is a number. Now the third portion. is very interesting it's going to be optional and this is a direction okay what do i mean now look at this example of whiskey 28 okay whiskey 28 not what this means is that this is a one way traffic okay traffic only in one way is allowed meaning imagine if there was a point a here and the point b was here okay If you look at it, B is roughly, roughly to the north of A. Meaning, if I were to ballpark things, any aircraft going from A to B is eventually going a little northwards. If this route was whiskey one, whiskey two eight north, I would have been allowed to fly on it. Why? Because I'm going northwards. But imagine in the same scenario, in the same route, if I were to come from Bravo, okay, to Alpha. Alpha is to the south of Bravo, you know. If we ballpark, if we roughly talk about it, that in that case I cannot fly on Whiskey two eight north. Why? Because the last letter tells us what direction traffic can flow. The traffic can only flow northwards on this. It's a unidirectional route. Okay. Not all routes have them. Most of the routes are, you know, you can fly both ways. You can go north, south, east, west. You can go on whatever whatever the orientation of the route is, both ways. But few of them, they are unidirectional. and that's why the third part is optional now you have different type of routes and we've segregated them according to the first letter okay so helicopter routes are given by k or kilo upper level routes are given by uniform supersonic routes are given by sierra and domestic routes are given by whisky now something which you guys will have to keep in mind our domestic non arnav routes are given by hotel juliet victor and whisky Okay, international non Arnav routes are given by Alpha, Bravo, Golf, and Romeo. In that case, in case it's international non Arnav route, in that case the direction will be given with an arrow. Okay, they will not follow the third portion. They will not have an alphabet to give you the direction. In that case, it will just be an arrow. For an international non Arnav route, if it is an international Arnav route, you will find Lima, Mike, November, and Papa as the prefix of the route, as the first letter of the route. you have to keep this in mind just so that you look out for the right things i hope you've understood this okay so now now that you've understood all of the structure of what ats routes are how are they named what is a aerodrome control what is a control zone what's a control area you've understood all these basic terminologies something which i want you to also understand is the transmission techniques will be following there are a few things i don't expect you to remember this off the book but i just need you to bring this in practice okay so the transmitting techniques the first major thing is that we have to maintain a steady rate of speech okay the rate of speech while talking should not exceed 100 words per minute okay a 60 word per minute is ideal right now what i'm talking 
is around the figure of 60 words per minute. The second one is we have to avoid using the word to and the word for just before the numbers. Okay, wherever you see a number, in most of the cases, you have to try and avoid to use to and for. Meaning, if in an example, we are requesting climb flight level 260, when we are, you know, um, transmitting it over RT, we'll say that we request climb 260. We should always try to minimize the usage of to and for. But there's a caveat. Imagine if we are you know, we, we were transmitting this, this following information over RT and we say we are passing flight level 50, cleared for flight level 150. Meaning we are, we are currently passing flight level 50 and we've been cleared to climb to flight level 150. In that case, how do we communicate? Here, the usage of for is mandatory. Meaning I have to say that I'm passing flight level 50 for flight level 150. This for defines my intentions as to where do I want to end up? On what flight level do I want to end up? What is my last clearance? So I'm passing flight level 50 for flight level 150. So here for is mandatory. Okay. Then we usually never use the phrase. You will see this mistakes a lot of places. If you have also checked out the Aditya Kumar uh, PDF that is, you know, very widely circulated for RTR preparation, you'll see a lot of places they have written go ahead. That is technically wrong. Okay, we do not use the phrase go ahead on hold shot or when we are lining up. Usually never when we are in these areas and the ATC calls us. We never use go ahead because it could be confused if some other aircraft hears that they could confuse it that that information or go ahead is for them. Okay, it can just lead to a lot of confusion. So if you were on a hold shot line or you were on the runway, and for some reason that you wanted to call the ATC while you're on the runway or while you're on hold shot, if you were an indigo flight, we could just say, I fly 120 Delhi Tower. Meaning, who are you? Whom are you calling? That's it. Or if Delhi Tower were to call you, in that case, you would not say Delhi Tower, this is I fly 120, go ahead. You cannot say this. You would have to just say Delhi Tower, I fly 120. Okay? Then. You have to maintain your radio communication performance. Meaning, if you are flying in a RCP-5, the ATC calls you, we need to respond within 5 seconds. The ATC usually has 10 seconds to reply. A golden rule which you guys will, for the ones of you who have flown, for the ones of you who have not started flying but will be flying, this is something which holds the basis of everything. It says, aviate first, navigate next, communicate later. So your first preference to, while you're in the cockpit is to aviate first, to navigate after that and to communicate after that. Your first priority is to fly the airplane. Your second priority is to navigate that airplane. Your third priority is to communicate with the air traffic controllers. It's always going to go this way. Fine. Now you have a term that is known as a sterile cockpit. A sterile cockpit is basically a cockpit in which no unnecessary communication happens up till you are you've reached 10,000 feet. Okay, because a lot of critical things are happening in the cockpit while you're reaching 10,000 feet. So you don't want to unnecessarily com communicate and you know, add to the stress or end up saying something wrong. Then you have the usage of mic. We're supposed to put the mic at a position from where it can receive audio waves. Usually for the transmission, I'll recommend put it on your upper lip. The usage of the word IMC. Now I'm sure you all know what is IMC conditions, what are VFR conditions, what's VMC conditions. So whenever the question says that you are flying inside the clouds, rain, rough weather, or any of these things, right after your call sign, you have to have say, you have to say IMC, meaning you're flying under instrument meteorological conditions. Okay, so Delhi Area Control, this is Victor Tango, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, IMC. Anything you see in apostrophes has to be read out the same way it is given here. Okay, this is a dialogue you're going to say. Think of it like that. So Delhi Area Control, this is Victor Tango, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, IMC flight. Now, you'll hear this term QBI. So QBI is a Q code for mandatory IFR. Think of it like there are such situations have arisen that now QBI is enforced, meaning... 
Now, all the flights have to mandatorily fly a IFR flight plan or they have to carry out and fly under instrument flight rules. They can no longer fly under VFR. Okay, let's say, let's say for example, that we are over Agona and QBI is enforced on Romeo 5904. Okay, we are a flight who has departed from Kujrao and we are going to Delhi and we are flying under visual flight rules. Okay, if flight rules are visual, that is this, you cannot change to IFR. Of course not. It is only possible if we have entered Yankee or Zulu on our flight plan. Why? If you guys recall of, you know, if you've studied what a flight plan is and how to fill a flight plan, you would have noticed that under flight rules, there are four ways for us to fill that flight plan. We could write V for VFR, I for IFR. Okay. Y for IFR first. Later, we will switch to VFR. Z says VFR first will later switch to IFR. And this point of switching also has to be mentioned in item number 18. Okay. In item number 15, sorry. So unless you're a Yankee or a Zulu aircraft, in both the cases in Yankee or Zulu, you could have shifted between VFR and IFR. Okay. You could have just shifted between IFR and VFR. Aapas mein. But if you're a purely VFR flight, when QBI is enforced, you cannot fly through that, right? You have to reroute yourself. For in our case, if QBI was enforced on Romeo 5904, we could not have continued as a VFR flight. We could not have continued on Romeo 5904. The best thing we could have done is requested for a special VFR. Okay, that is within our limits and boundaries. So the only remaining option left is to reroute. Okay, so if you're a visual flight, always remember you cannot fly because it says only mandatory IFR aircrafts are allowed there. Whereas if you're a Yankee or a Zulu, if you fill that in your flight plan that you know you are capable of flying VFR and IFR, in that case, yeah, sure, go ahead, fly into that area. There's no problem. If nothing works, you have to reroute. Now, try to use a lot of RT phrases and aviation terminologies. Okay, try to communicate like A firm means yes, will come means will uh, comply. All of these terms you'll come across when we are studying. Try to use them as much as you can. And try to take a slight pause when you're saying a number. Okay, these are some very basic things that we're supposed to follow. None of them have to be kept in mind. It's all very practical. But you will have to keep in mind these few rules. Like I cannot say flight level 320. I'll have to take a pause. I'll have to say flight level 320. Okay. 